right, guys, let's take a look at China. You might have studied China a little bit in sixth grade. Um, we're going to move. We're going to go on from that. Um, we're really going to focus on about five of the dynasties, even though we're going to talk about more. So let's jump right into it. So these are the dynasties that we want you to focus on. So get your notes set up. Let's set up a tree map. You could use uh, Cornell notes if you want to, but let's set up a tree map uh, that looks like this. You have a copy of the slideshow, so I'm not going to stay on this slide very long. You can use that, set that up, and come back to the video. But these are the dynasties we're going to look at. The Sui, the Tang, the Song, the Yuan, and the Ming dynasty. So take a second, pause this, take a second, get your, your uh, notes set up, and then come on back. All right, your objective today, well, let's first start with the big idea. Um, rulers have a great impact on their society and leave lasting effects. It's very appropriate. I'm actually doing this on November 3rd, 2020, which is a big, big election day. So we're electing a new, not ruler, but president, but kind of goes hand in hand with this. Um, and also... During this lesson, you will learn how leaders of Chinese dynasties and Chinese philosophy less left lasting impressions on their empires. So first of all, if you want to check out your vocabulary for this part of the lesson, um, click here and that will take you to a vocabulary list that you can study. Now, let's move on. Uh, before we start, I want you to think about these three questions as we go along. Hint, hint, hint. You might have to answer or do something with them at the end. So how do belief systems influence people's ways of life? Uh, how do rulers shape present and future civilizations? How are lasting effects of rulers reflected in a society? So think about all of those. Think about all of those as we go through this slideshow. And again, because it's appropriate, you might want to think about those things as we're going through our own election here in the next couple of weeks. So let's get started in this um, slideshow. You can click around and go however you want. I'm going to go straight through it. I do want you to go through everything, but you can go through at your own pace and go through how you want to go through it. First, let's start with the Zhao dynasty. Um, this um, will actually start towards the end of the Zhao dynasty. The dynasty split and fell into a time of war. Out of this uh, time period, we were introduced to two major Chinese philosopher, philosophers and their teachings. Uh, these teachings came in part as a response to all this chaos and everything that was all these warring and fighting that was going on. Um, th in the next couple slides, I'm going to talk about Confucianism and Taoism. Um, so because we have this chaos and fighting, well, something needed to happen. We've talked about in two other um, societies, we talked about Rome and medieval Europe, chaos and fighting. We see it again here. So in response to that, we have these two religions coming up, or philosophies, Confucianism and Taoism. Confucianism was started by a man named Confucian. That should be fairly easy to remember. Confucianism um, started by Confucian. Taoism uh, was started by a man named Lao Tzu. Uh, the big difference between these two um, religions are Confucianism preached things like duty, things like honoring those around you. For instance, relationship between, between um, kids and their parents, teachers and students, um, your boss and workers, friendships, things like that. And then also respecting and, and, and honoring those above you, um, obeying rules, things like that. Lao Tzu and Taoism is a little bit different. And here's how I will compare it. If you were going to school and you were a Confucianist, you would make sure you were on time. You would make sure if class started at eight, you were there at eight. You would make sure that you followed the rules and you respected the teachers. If you were a Taoist, well, you might be walking to school and it starts at eight and notice a flower on the ground on your way. Well, you would stop and admire that flower and just be like, wow, this grew here. This is, looks, these colors are great. This is awesome. I can't believe it. Um, and take time to appreciate that nature. And then after you're done appreciating the flower, if you walked on and noticed, wow, look at these cloud formations. This is wonderful. I'm going to just take a look at these and take all of this in. Because a Taoist isn't really bound by a schedule. So if you show up by eight, you show up by eight. Mm. 
it might be more important for me to stop and take in my surroundings and be one with nature. Maybe that's the lesson that I'm supposed to learn today and not to be at school at eight o'clock and follow all those other rigid rules. So that's really the big difference between Taoism and Confucianism. So we're going to look at these different dynasties. Um, let's just get started. First of all, early dynasties. The Qin dynasty was the first that unified China. You might have seen these terracotta warriors. Um, and they were they were constructed during that time. If you notice in all the writing on the slides, we do have it highlighted. Those are notes that you could take. Those are important things that we think that you should know. Um, the Han dynasty, this is a big one you might have studied in sixth grade. Um, instituted, well, they were around during a, a golden age in China where there was a lot of science going on, medicine, technology, and different parts in the arts. After the Han Dynasty, there was chaos and fighting again. There was a disunification. People weren't getting along um, after the um, that dynasty. Now we're really going to look at what happens after that, after the Han Dynasty and what happened. And we want to see how rulers have a great impact on their society and leave lasting effects. Um, so this, again, you can jump around at your own pace and go to different dynasties at different times. I'm going to go straight through all of them on this next slide. If you see some of these things are hyperlinked, these are the five dynasties we're going to talk about. And then also the people and pictures below will take you to more information if you want to learn more about each dynasty. So let's just get started with the Sui dynasty. The Sui dynasty was ruled uh, by a man named Wendy. Well, first ruled by a man named Wendy. And they reunified China. They put China back together. Um, they spread Buddhism, which is a, a religion from India. We're not going to talk about that much here, um, but it was a religion from India that, that China really embraced and kind of changed around into something that worked for them. Um, he also incorporated, uh, Wendy also incorporated Confucianism and Taoism together. So taking the parts that they liked and, and mingling those two together. There uh, were a lot of public works. That means, you know, buildings and things being built. And one, the Grand Canal, this is, uh, still exists. This Grand Canal was one of the largest, if not the largest canals ever, uh, man-made canal. And it really made travel communication, trade, and things much easier by building this. Um, let's move on to the Tang Dynasty. Um, in the Tang Dynasty, the only female, we see the only female empress, uh, Wu Zetan. Um, so they could have females be empress, uh, be an empress. Didn't happen all that much, but you know, at least it happened once. Their government was run by a bureaucracy. That's an old word that we've gone over. That means government run by different um, different departments. Uh, the Tang used principles of Confucianism in their government, specifically in how to choose officials. Government officials were required to take state exams. Those officials were called scholar officials. So you had to prove your worth academically if you wanted to be an uh, official of government, which sounds really nice, which sounds like, yes, that should probably be a good idea. However, uh, the problem is not everybody had the money to uh, get the schooling or take the test. So you start eliminating people from having that ability to take those tests, which then it kind of gets less, you know, for the people and more for specific families that can afford those exams. Um, they started working the Silk Road. We're going to talk about this a lot, a lot, a lot later. And this was a series of trade routes between China and Europe. Uh, the Tang also uh, took advantage of the opportunity to trade with India, right? India, the Middle East, and even into Europe. Um, some of their innovations, we have a whole unit on innovations and achievements that we're going to go over later. We're going to find that China invented just about everything. But at first, they had the largest empire of their time. Um, they came up with woodblock printing, which we're going to talk about a lot. That's a very important innovation. Mechanical clock, porcelain, gunpowder, uh, wrote a lot of poetry, books, right? Literature, and then painting. So let's look at the Song Dynasty. Song Dynasty continued with the state exams, the same ones as scholar officials from the previous dynasty. However, they changed them. Uh, they created state-run schools and made exams more accessible to all students. So now they still wanted you to pass that exam, but more people could access the exams, which made things better. Um, the song also created a meritocracy. We talked about that a little bit. That's where um, leaders gained their positions based on their abilities. So 
you know, if you proved yourself, you could become a, an, uh, a state official. It didn't matter what family you came that you were part of, but if you were a good worker, if you did good things, if, if you proved yourself, you could be a state official as well. They uh, practice Neo-Confucianism, that means New Confucianism, and blended Confucianism and Taoism with Buddhism. So kind of the same as before, com combining these three religions and philosophies. They emphasize Confucius' idea of duty. There were five important relationships, parents and children, teachers, students, older and younger siblings, husband and wife, and friends. In each of those relationships, there was a, kind of a ranking system, parents above kids, teachers above students. And all of those are sick friends, friends, you were equal. Their achievements were uh, or many more, but some of the highlights are paper money, uh, magnetic compass, and movable type, even taking that woodblock printing one step further. And again, you can click on these to learn more about each of these. So let's look at the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty was also known as the Mongol Empire. Uh, it was ruled first by Genghis Khan and... Um, it unified the nomadic tribes in Northern and Central Asia. The Mongol Empire became the first nomadic empire. I think we're going to look at this empire on their own later on in the year. Uh, the conquest, they, they, they conquered vast amounts of, of Asia and almost into Europe. They, at one point, had the largest empire of land empire of all time. They were fierce fighters. They were very brutal. When they came in to take over your city, they took it over in very brutal fashion. Um, later on, Kublai Khan was uh, Genghis Khan's grandson, and he's the one who grew the empire to its largest. Um, they also kept the bureaucracy. They ruled by different departments. Um, they allowed, they were not Chinese, even though they're a Chinese dynasty. Uh, but they allowed Chinese officials to serve. They got rid of the exam system. They they also let people that weren't Chinese serve. They had uh, Muslim people who were part of their uh, their government. They had uh, people from all different walks of life, from all different places that were parts of their government. At their height, they were, the, like I said, the largest land empire of all time. Um, and really opened up the Silk Road, again, that we're going to talk about later. And that Silk Road started connecting Again, Europe and Asia um, and the Middle East and everything all together. Let's look at the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty, uh, Peking, which today uh, is Beijing, was their capital city. And it was a forbidden city. It was a walled city built uh, that, that, that housed palaces, uh, great halls, courtyards, gardens, and more. It was home to the emperor of, and other Ming government officials. Uh, Zhu Yuanzhang was a commoner that took advantage of the chaos at the end of the Yuan Dynasty. He led a peasant army to victory over the Yuan Dynasty at its capital, Daedu, and proclaimed himself Emperor Hongwu. So this was Hongwu was a commoner, got an army together after the Yuan Dynasty fell and became the emperor of China. Um, he called his new empire the Ming or Brilliant Dynasty. He brought back many Chinese government devices like the civil service exams. So the Yuan Dynasty got rid of the exams, he brought them back. He also led efforts to rebuild uh, bridges, walls, canals, and other things in China. Um, at the end of the Ming Dynasty, we have Yongli, um, and during the Ming rule, they set out a many maritime, that means of the ocean expeditions. Um, a Muslim man named Zheng Ha was the most famous of all these captains. He was sent by an, by Emperor Yongli to meet with other kingdoms all around Asia and even into Africa, um, spreading the word of how great the uh, Ming Dynasty was. He would collect tribute, which would either be a trade for goods and things like that, or it might be just collecting items to bring back to the empire. And um, he captained a ship that was several times larger than Christopher Columbus's. We're going to talk about him later. It's huge. And his fleets had hundreds and hundreds of ships and thousands of people on those ships. So he just had like a whole huge armada of ships. That's it for this lesson. Um, now that you're done, remember the essential questions. We want you to go back into your notes and write a summary using these uh, essential questions to process what you learn and what we went over. So how do belief systems influence people's way of life? How do rulers shape present and future civilizations? And how are lasting effects of rulers reflected in a society? So that's it for today. And 
Hope you enjoyed it.